Uh, hello, my name is uh, Stefan Meyer. I am here with the Finland Food Chain up in Finland, Minnesota. For those of you who might be outside of our area and listening in tonight. So tonight we have a, a one hour session with Kevin Edberg from the Cooperative Development Services. Um, Kevin, is that located over in Wisconsin? Is that correct? We are domic uh, legally domiciled in Wisconsin. Our staff this uh, these days are almost all in Minnesota, and we okay. are home officing at various places around the Twin Cities. Okay, okay. So you're one foot in each side of the uh, the border, technically. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so again, so the Finland food chain, uh, that's a work that we have begun up here about a year and a half ago. And there's a group of us working on multiple fronts around designing and implementing uh, kind of a, a Finland regional food system, uh, a part of which is working towards a producer's cooperative up here in the Finland area. Um, we do have one of the oldest running um, cooperatives at currently in existence in Minnesota. Uh, that's the Finland Cooperative, um, which I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Corey, actually began as a producer's co-op way back in the day. Yep. Um, yep. And when that was, uh, there were a lot of uh, new Finnish immigrants to the area and uh, Finnish farmers. Um, and uh, so we're just kind of, part of our work is working at understanding and looking at developing a, a producer's co-op um, for kind of the new age and for our current situation and looking forward. And for that reason, we have reached out to Kevin here with the uh, Cooperative Development Services. Uh, and, we've, and he's been really helpful in already getting our minds turning. And this is kind of the second stage that we wanted to open up to whoever wanted to join us in this journey. And hopefully we'll inspire you wherever you are. Um, so a couple little uh, housekeeping things. Um, again, everybody will be muted. So if you have any questions, I will be tracking both the Q&A at the bottom um, and the chat. But if you want to chat, you can certainly see over there at the bottom, it says either to all panelists and attendees or to all panelists. You wanna make sure you're speaking to all panelists and attendees. Otherwise the other attendees won't be able to see anything you say. Um, so make sure you click that down there at the bottom, but right where you type in your message. Um, and otherwise, uh, yeah, what we'll do is I'll turn things over to Kevin. He'll introduce himself and kind of do his first section. And uh, what, we'll, what he'll do is he's going to break this up into three sections. And then we're going to have a little Q&A after each section. So I'll track your questions. And then when he kind of gets to the end of his first 10 to 12 minute segment, we'll answer all the questions that have popped up. And then he'll launch into his second segment and do the same thing over. Um, so again, welcome, and I will now turn things over to Kevin. Very good, thank you, Stefan. So um, I'm the Executive Director of Cooperative Development Services. CDS is a 35-year-old nonprofit created by the uh, cooperative community in Wisconsin in 1985. In 1991, uh, that original entity merged with another co-op development uh, uh, entity in the Twin Cities, and uh, we have been uh, representing Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa uh, for the last uh, about 20, uh, 30 years, something like that. Uh, I've been the executive director for almost 20 years. My 20th anniversary comes up on October 15th. So um, uh, it's been a, a real pleasure for me to, to be able to do this work. My first experience with cooperatives actually was as a farmer producer. Back in about 1969, my grandfather and I had a very large garden near the family cabin in Moose Lake. That fall, uh, we had way, way, way too many rutabagas for our family to eat. Grandpa waxed them and sold them in town to the uh, uh, local uh, co-op, which at that time I believe was part of the Midland system of cooperatives. Uh, I got a check for, it was 70 pounds and I got a check for 70 bucks. And I thought that was a grand thing as a 12 or 13 year old. And then the next March, I got another check from the co-op for 70 cents. And it took me almost 40 years to figure out that that was my pat patronage distribution from my uh, fall sale. Uh, they had declared a 1% uh, distribution of surplus. 
And uh, that 70 cent check represented my, uh, my patronage distribution that year. Um, and it's been uh, uncovering thing, interesting things like that about co-ops that has kept this work being really interesting. So my presentation tonight is intended to give a sense of what kinds of work and process and spacing um, can be used for people wanting to start uh, producer co-ops, consumer-owned co-ops, uh, marketing co-ops. This presentation really doesn't lend itself well for people thinking about housing cooperatives. That's primarily uh, related to the uh, role of real estate in that, uh, in that sector. Uh, and it probably doesn't work so well with worker-owned cooperatives. There's a, a different approach that I like better. But for marketing co-ops and producer co-ops and consumer-owned, this presentation is, uh, uh, is well-suited for that. And my objective is just to give you an outline of the path that a group would walk if they were to um, uh, try and, and uh, successfully move through a cooperative startup. Uh, so with that, I'm going to actually go to the slides. And... All of a sudden, my buttons aren't working. There we go. Okay, so almost every project has at least three phases. I'm gonna uh, kind of lump them. You have an organizing phase. That's when people are getting together and trying to understand if there is a common need or interest and whether there is um, uh, enough energy and passion to uh, move forward and, and start a business development uh, process. Then you move into a feasibility and planning stage. <clears throat> and in this process, you're applying tests like, is it reasonable to believe that we can financially make this work uh, work? Is there a market for our services? Can we uh, create a value chain that uh, returns, that probably requires investment and is there a return on that investment? And are there operational metrics that we can use? So there's a whole bunch of feasibility and planning activity. And if the, at the end of that, there is still a pathway that uh, can be uh, actualized. That's when you move into in, uh, implementation. The vast majority of this presentation is gonna take place in that organizing and feasibility and planning uh, bucket, uh, not so much on implementation. <coughs> I do wanna note that we think that in all three of these stages, that there are four cornerstones that are present in each one, starting in the upper left with vision. Certainly in that organizing phase, people are saying, what do we need? What is our shared need? What is our shared approach for how we might meet that need? We tend to find that vision is present in all four, um, <coughs> all, four um, all three of the stages, but it gets refined and vision uh, tends to get more specific as you learn more about the particular sector and the business needs and so forth. So vision starts relatively large and amorphous, tends to become more concrete and specific as you move through the process. Moving to the upper right in talent, encourage people to think broadly about talent. Certainly that involves the people who are involved in leading the process. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, the role of steering committee members, for example. It might be your board of directors, the talent of a manager. Uh, it could be the talent of consultants that you might hire for various aspects of, of your project. So talent is present in all three stages, um, uh, but in different forms. Moving to the lower left, capital. Um, sometimes in the organizing stages, the need for capital is simply to buy milk and cookies for the uh, steering committee to get together and have a conversation about uh, what, they are, uh, what they want out of this enterprise. As you move on, capital might take the form of how are we going to pay for consultants that we might want to hire or project managers. At some point, if you move to implementation, there's going to need, be a need for equity in the cooperative. That's the uh, represents the financial interests of the member owners. Um, so it takes, capital takes multiple forms. And then systems, again, present in every, uh, every stage, but again, morphing. So at the very beginning, it might uh, be, uh, the system might be a list of, so who's showing up and expressing interest and wants to go on a listserv? 
it can become as detailed as so how many members do we have what's their financial contribution what uh, what is their financial stake in the cooperative and there's a whole bunch of other systems that you can have but the idea is to think about in each stage of what are these four um, buckets of, of activity and how do they relate to the work that you're in and as I note, we're going to spend most of this time on the organizing and feasibility uh, planning component so at the beginning of a process it almost always starts with a group of people saying we need to do fill in the blank or our community needs fill in the blank you um, i sometimes explain it that uh, i get a phone call after a bunch of farmers in um, uh, are sitting around a cafe and uh, uh, breakfast table and before they roll dice to figure out who's paying for coffee somebody says we need to dot 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 and at a certain point in time people said you know we've been saying that long enough let's do something and that's when they call in folks like me so we start with this diverse crowd of, uh, of folks who think they might have something uh, in common they've uh, um, in your case, it might be a viable pathway to a marketplace for locally produced foods. But there's all kinds of ways and shapes and uh, uh, ways of describing what those benefits might be. I simply call them goodies. Um, people join the cooperative because they, they want goodies. And you can uh, determine for yourselves what those goodies are. And the whole purpose of this process is to ask the question, is it reasonable to believe that this group can obtain their goodies through group action? That's kind of what, what we're all engaged in. So one of the first things that I encourage a nascent cooperative to do is to form a steering committee. The role of that committee, it's, there's multiple uh, roles that, and tasks that they will take on, but it starts with an articulation of a vision going to be a morphous that's not going to be uh, perfect but it's to gather people together and say what is the need that we have in common and what are the strategies that we think we might be interested in pursuing so it starts with that idea of vision I encourage groups not to put up a sign-up sheet and say who wants to be on the steering committee I find that's actually one of the least successful strategies to use a better strategy in my mind is to put up a sheet and says that says who wants to be the committee that recruits the steering committee <clears throat> in other words I want to find uh, a group of people that will go out and recruit the dream team to lead this project and it's that sense of the dream team um, uh, who are the people who um, share an interest that bring diverse sets of skills, knowledge, experience, um, might be geographic or uh, demographic representation. If you know that you are gonna need producers near the Twin Cities, you might wanna consider having a steering committee member that comes from that area so that they can bring um, the information about this project to another group. That's entirely possible as well. So think intentionally about the makeup of the dream team. I suggest that every steering committee needs to have at least one champion. Now the champion is the, the person who has fire in the belly for this idea. Um, they're the ones that make sure that the meetings get held and the notices get uh, sent out. Um, they are the ones that are kind of the spark plug that, incur that ensures that things happen because most of us have got really busy lives. We have other things to do we often need that encouragement a spark plug sometimes uh, so every steering committee needs at least one champion at any given time i have seen projects that have had two champions at the same time and they take turns and share leadership roles i've never seen one with three champions at the same time i have seen them where a champion does their work and then they move into other work or they, they have to leave the community for other reasons and somebody else steps in. So you can have multiple champions over time. I've never seen more than two at any given time, but it's important that they exist because they keep, play, uh, play key roles 
in moving the uh, group forward. And then we surround uh, the, that champion with uh, other skill sets and, uh, and so forth. I want to say one word about integrity. Um, integrity on the part of uh, uh, steering committee members is absolutely essential because <clears throat> at some point down the road, this idea, if it matures into a business plan that's going to be put in front of a group of people for investment, they're going to sit on a stage somewhere, picture a school auditorium, and here's the steering committee on the stage, and you have your potential owner members in their pocket hearing the pitch. And you want those folks to say, oh, Mary's on the steering committee. That's awesome. Mary is active in our community. She's trusted. She's always kept her word. We can, I've done business with her on a handshake. If Mary says this is an idea worth thinking about, I want to think about it. The converse of that might be George. And you may you want to avoid the possibility that folks sitting out in the audience say, oh, George, you know, let me tell you stories about how George has not failed, has not uh, followed through on his word in his business dealings with me. And if he has something to do with this, there's an angle to be had, I want nothing to do with it, all right? So it's this sense of you are in the process even from the, the time you select the steering committee members, you are looking for ways of building trust and integrity in bringing forth an idea because cooperation travels at the speed of trust. And so this whole ability to advance this idea through, through cooperation requires integrity and trust. Enough on that. So once a steering committee is formed, I encourage the group to do some intellectual tire kicking. The formal name might be pre-feasibility analysis, but what you're doing is uh, the group is asking itself, okay, so without hiring anybody, without having to pay anything, let's go find out what we can learn. So you might go out on the internet. You might call producers in other places. You might find a co-op uh, out there that has done something similar to what you're looking at. And you get on the phone and have a conversation or uh, share a, a conference call. Um, so you might jump in the van and uh, take a group and go visit another group just to see how they're doing. And often you will find that uh, members of other steering committees will all say, of course you can come and visit. Yeah, the co-op committee can be, our community can be very, uh, uh, very sharing and, and caring in that regard. But the idea of this is all to kind of do a gut check within the steering committee before you go out and raise a lot of money or spend a lot of money. It's, it's the sense of uh, what do we want to learn? What do we think we could learn simply on our own? And, and let's put that together. At the end of that pre-feasibility pre research, there's actually a, a, a piece that I call a go, no-go step. <laughs> look around the, uh, uh, around the group uh, and you say, okay, have we heard anything that's a deal stopper? Have we heard anything that says, no, nah, this was a dumb idea, or it's a great idea, it's just not for us, all right? That's the no-go conversation. If you haven't heard one of those, you might say, okay, we haven't lost anything, let's proceed to the next step. That's a go step, all right? And you have that first go, no-go conversation uh, after that pre-feasibility research. At this point, I often encourage groups to incorporate, to do a very basic incorporation um, with articles of incorporation filed with the Secretary of State. By doing that, you're, you're able to go to the IRS and get a tax information number, a TIN, um, and you, with that, you're able to go to a bank and get a bank account so that you are now in control of resources. You can raise, uh, uh, store, and spend money uh, in your own name. You can apply for grants. You can do any number of things. There will be an opportunity later where I'll give you a, show you a second place where you could incorporate if you don't want to do it early. But I encourage early incorporations um, for those practical reasons of being able to uh, raise and spend money, but also because once you're an incorporated entity, the reasonable business decisions of the steering committee are protected by what's known as the corporate veil that if the committee goes out and makes reasonable business decisions, spends money on behalf of the group, and nothing happens, so long as their business decisions are reasonable, 
they do not have to worry about retribution from people that uh, uh, invested money and said, hey, I'm out this money, you owe me dot, dot, dot. Um, you have a corporate bail for protection. And so that's a reason that I like to think about that. So the International Cooperative Alliance describes a cooperative as being an independent organization, a didn't, an independent association of people who have a, a common cultural, uh, economic, or social uh, need or desire. And they satisfy that desire through a mutually owned and democratically governed business enterprise. What we have here on the right-hand side of this screen, this education and outreach, is how we build the democratic association of members. On the left-hand side of the screen is how we test the viability and the uh, uh, business opportunity. And that's, so we have two sides of the co-op and each parts of the co-op is gonna have its own side here. So, left we have the business test, on the right we have this, um, uh, how do we grow an interested group of potential members. So, on the business side, the business development piece of cooperative development is not substantially different from almost any other kind of business development activity. If it's a particularly large or complex project, uh, especially where you're going to raise money and if you spend it all without good result, um, there's going to be an ouch somewhere. Some to, or if you're going to need to borrow money to implement your idea at some point, many folks will start with a feasibility study. A feasibility study is a process where you ask the, the question, is there at least one way that we could get our goodies? And you typically will assess things like, What's the market feasibility? Um, you'll ask about operations, you'll ask about technology, and you'll certainly ask about finances. So those are all traditional parts of a feasibility study. And again, you do those if the, uh, if the project has the capacity of either requiring external finance, a bank debt, for example, um, or if it's a particularly complex project. <coughs> At the end of the uh, feasibility study, you have another, you have one of those go, no go conversations. If you have heard things uh, in the feasibility process that say, uh, uh, not for us, that's a no go. Rather than taking that as a, a reason for a feel, feeling of failure, I suggest that's a, a reason to have a party. The community now knows something that it didn't know before. It has exercised some, uh, some community organizing activities. You know people and you know more about your community. That's a re those are all good things, throw a party. If you are continuing on, then the next step typically is a business plan. So the feasibility study asks, is there at least one way to do this work? The business plan says, and this is the way that we intend to operate the business. And again, it's got a bunch of components, fairly standard stuff for uh, folks that are looking at, uh, at business development. And at the end of the business plan, you have another one of those go, no go conversations. Um, and if you stop, you, you have a party, and if you continue going, Here's where you would then go back and update your articles and bylaws because now you know how you think your business is going to operate. And so now would be a good time to go back and align your early work with articles and bylaws and any other legal documents and um, make sure that they are aligned with the proposed business that you uh, intend, to, uh, intend to operate. If you did not incorporate early on, back after the pre-feasibility research, this would be the second, the, uh, second place where you could now incorporate uh, because you have a, a stronger sense of the kind of business that you uh, intend to operate, who are you gonna be your member owners, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's all available here. So I'm gonna stop there, Stefan, if there are some questions, comments, um, this would be the end of the first chunk. Let me stop and just see if there's uh, something that I should uh, respond to. 
Um, whoops, let's see, start video. Uh, well, there was a little bit of a discussion, just kind of confirming in the chat room, confirming exactly what a, a champion is, um, which I kind of responded to based upon what you said. That's just the person with the fire in the belly to make sure the project keeps moving forward. Yeah. Uh, would you kind of define that or add some Absolutely. more? Absolutely. There is no, um, there's no extra special medals. There usually are no, uh, no raises or, or promotions uh, available. Um, it's you it's like you need this spark plug you need somebody who's good at getting people to gather and follow through on the things that they committed to do okay um otherwise yeah i don't i don't think we have any other oh let's see we have a knee here um okay someone is asking what's kind of a workable size of a steering committee from like your minimum to your maximum in your opinion yeah great question I typically say somewhere between five and nine. Um, I would like to see in, so it, it does depend on how big your project is going to be. I've seen ethanol projects in the 90s with where they were getting together a couple thousand farmers. They had a relatively robust steering committee, but even then it wasn't much more than a dozen. Uh, it's just hard to sustain that level of uh, involvement, even in large projects early on. Um, but I'd like to suggest that you never want to get certainly below three and ideally not below five. Life happens. We know that people uh, commit to things and then life doesn't always allow them to complete that uh, commitment. So I, I think a, a good workable role, uh, role is between five and nine and to aim for that and to expect turnover and to be prepared for that. Excellent question. Um, okay, if there's uh, no other questions. Um, oh, okay, here's another good question. And your steering committee, do you think you would always want an odd number in case when it comes to voting? <laughs> well, it, that's a, that is indeed a great question. It begs a different question, which is, so every steering committee gets to make their own decisions about, so are we going to use majority rule? Are we going to make decisions by consensus? Are we going to, you know, I mean, there's a variety of ways that groups make decisions and judge that decision to be valid, all right? And voting is one of them. That's the most common. Uh, and to that extent, yeah, seven is a good number. But um, sometimes I think we let ourselves get trapped into numbers as opposed to what's the quality of our decision-making process and what is the, what are the, uh, other attributes that make a decision a good decision or a right and reasonable decision. So variety of ways of thinking about it. Excellent answer. Okay, that looks like that wrapped up the questions for that first component. Okay, so that's the business side. That's testing the business pro uh, proposition that for example, is it possible for a group of farmers to form an organization that will, uh, that will meet a market need in our region and provide a right livelihood to the producer member owners? Okay, that's, we're having the business side. Now, in, on the right-hand side, we're talking about, so how do we grow interest in this idea and how do we recruit potential members? Remember when we started, we had a, a, a relatively amorphous group of folks that are saying, yeah, okay, let's, let's, let's see what we can learn. But at a certain point in time, it needs to be a more specific question, like, will people invest capital in order to create the business that might end up delivering that, uh, that uh, piece of goodie uh, for, for the owner members? So we start with, um, there's going to be three or four slides here, fundraising, somebody needs to raise money in this developmental stage, in this organizing stage, in case you're going to hire an attorney or um, uh, hire a consultant to do a feasibility study or, or, or. There's usually need for some cash somewhere. Some of that can come from community capital, could be a grant. Uh, some of it might come out of a, uh, come out of members and a membership uh, 
a fee. Sometimes it comes from an individual who makes a loan uh, to the group with an understanding that the loan gets paid back under this, that, or the other circumstance. But money is almost always involved in some way. And this is simply raising money for the development process. I'll talk about money in another context in just a moment. <clears throat> Not everybody always knows everything they might want to or need to about cooperatives. So there's a place for cooperative education as a part of this process, particularly for folks who haven't, who don't come from a tradition of working inside uh, cooperative business. Um, they may have a whole ton of questions about, so what does it mean to be a patron member? And what is this distribution called patronage? Or why do we do this, this, that, or the other thing in this way? So there is definitely a space in here for being intentional about saying, well, let's go learn about being a cooperative. If we think we're going to be owner members of one, we may in fact want to go and have a deeper understanding of that. So let's go visit the credit union. Let's go visit the rural electric. Let's go visit the, the food co-op, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a sense of how do we grow our acumen and our understanding around what it means to be mutually uh, owners, mutual owners of a business. And all in all of this process, you're casting a net. You're trying to grow a cloud of interested uh, members in the co-op. Might have started with two or three around that kitchen, uh, around that cafe table, but you're going to have to at some point say, huh, do we need a half dozen, a dozen, two dozen? What's the, what's the number of folks that we can reasonably serve and how do we, how do we make the right folks aware of the opportunities to participate? And so what are we doing with Facebook? What are we doing with listservs? What are we doing with um, meet and greet nights or tabling uh, at the co-op or, or, or? It's all a process of helping people become aware of the opportunities to um, uh, participate in this venture and uh, to learn about the, the vision, goals, and aspirations of the enterprise. All right, so I'm going to stop there for another moment. Are there some more uh, some more questions, kind of about that democratic association side of the conversation? Oh, let's see here. Um, so, just kind of an interesting add-in uh, from Corey that the Finland the original Finland Co-op was largely started through a loan from a community member. And it took them about two, he thinks it took them about two to three years to pay that member back. So that's just an interesting example of how that started here in Finland originally. Yeah, and not uncommon at all. Um, and then from uh, Cindy, we have, uh, so we have lots of folks who like the idea of a producer co-op, but very diverse perspectives on what that means and how fast we should see results. Mm -hmm. um, she's, she's noting that that discrepancy can lead to disillusionment and frustration. Is that a failure of the business process of the education out or, or the education outreach process? What advice do you have for us to deal with this very dynamic process? Mm -hmm. Great questions. The, my sense is that mostly that disconnect comes from uh, unmet expectations. And so where I would uh, start in my encouragement is to say, let's, especially in the early stages, uh, when vision is not tightly articulated, it's like, don't make too, too many promises. It's like, we're learning. Um, so you keep the expectations manageable. Certainly you want to give a direction that, hey, this is mostly for folks that are producing food goods or locally produced goods that can be sold at retail. Okay, as opposed to if there's you know something else that's not on the table, be be straight with folks. You can tell them what you're what you're looking at, but manage those expectations. And then, particularly when you get into the business planning process, um, I think most folks understand cognitively the idea that if we're going to start a business, we mostly need to 
uh, make an investment first and we get the benefits, there's going to be a stream of benefits over time and the aggregated value of that stream of benefits outweighs the investments, uh, the, the upfront investments. Um, but that cognitive knowledge sometimes gets in the way of our lived experience and we want benefits faster than we can generally deliver them. So that's where in thinking realistically about, um, okay, here's our first year, first year's business plan for how much volume we're going to do. Well, what happens if you have inclement weather that prevents you from having reaching your volume goals? Uh, you're not going to hit your volume goals. You may, in fact, have to take on more debt. Uh, there's a whole variety of things that come into that conversation. I think it's uh, having that sober conversation about um, uh, what the business can and potentially will do that helps inform, helps create the proper level of patience. Some other things that influence patience is transparency of your decision-making process and of your operating process. It's like if folks know and understand what you're, what you're experiencing, most folks can put two and two together and say, oh, bad windstorm, bad uh, late freeze, whatever. Um, George and Sally didn't get their, their, their early uh, transplants uh, froze off. Uh, they're gonna have tomatoes, but it's gonna be a whole lot less. Um, that's gonna have some impact. And here's about what we think it's gonna be. Having, just being clear with folks and communicating transparently, transparently about what's going on helps people see and understand the uh, issues that they're, that they're facing. And in all of this, um, trying to be clear about um, if we're gonna make this business grow, we share in the business, we share equitably in its success, we share equitably in its challenges. And how do we, how do we think about that? And we talk, talk about that a lot. Um, those would be some of the things that, uh, that I would encourage. And I guess the last thing I'll mention on that is the, the sense of vision the, the vision of what the group wants to do needs to be compelling enough that it causes somebody to say, you know what, I understand there's risk. I still want, I, that, that vision is something I want and I'm willing to share the risk of getting that. So thinking wisely about what the end goal is and what, it, and what success looks like and talking and sharing that among each other helps properly calibrate that, that larger conversation. Okay, it looks like we have one other question, um, and this one might be a little more difficult to, to answer, um, but uh, I understand each project is different, the person writes, but what amount of money is needed to move us or move a project up to this point of the process? If there's a, is there kind of a range of kind of the minimum amount for doing feasibility, for doing business planning, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So um, I can't give you that number tonight. I can give you some of the parameters that I would think about. So for example, I would need to know how much volume are you thinking you uh, uh, want to move through this business and what infrastructure is required to do that. If you're moving fruits and vegetables, they are notoriously picky about having the proper storage temperature from the time you harvest them, clean them, uh, store them until delivery, et cetera, et cetera. Do you have the proper infrastructure in the form of a vehicle, in the form of coolers or freezers or whatever it takes? And who has those? Can, do, you, do some of your owner members have that capacity already and they would share that for some type of fee or in lieu of some, some uh, other cost. Um, all of those operating things uh, are a complete, it depends. A similar question is, do we anticipate having hired management or will we at least in the beginning have a working board or uh, some type of volunteer or you know, kind of compensated uh, person who performs tasks that keep the, the wheels moving um, that don't cost. 
Um, what comfort do you need to satisfy investors, particularly if you have bank debt um, that you might consider? Um, and so all of those are questions that I can't answer because I really don't know enough about your venture to make that decision. Here's some things that I think do offset that risk. There has historically been at least one federal program called the USDA Value Added Producer Grant Program that has planning grant funds available and they are matching. Some of the match can be in kind, some needs to be cash, uh, but they will provide resources to assist in hiring. If you, if you need consultants, that can be used for a part of that process. Another part of that um, program has working capital grants, again, match dollar for dollar, um, to encourage uh, these types of value added businesses. Um, CDS has a, a long track record of helping people access them, and uh, we're actually pretty good at it. Um, the, there have been, at various times, state grants that do the same thing, and it has been sometimes possible for us to work with the group and help them get both a state grant as well as a federal grant. And the state money is the match to the federal grant and the federal money is the match to the state grant and there is very little required out of pocket of producers. Sometimes that happens. There may be other things that can be used. Um, uh, and my personal goal is that we try and buy down um, a good, as much of that risk of the, of the business development stage as possible. Um, having said that, there is magic in having skin in the game. And we always encourage folks who are going to be sharing in business ownership, you want them to have skin in the game. You want it to hurt at least a little bit if they walk away and the business goes under. And it's that skin in the game that motivates us to put in the extra hours, the extra time, the extra energy that helps the business through hard times. So you know, finding a balance between what's the right amount of skin in the game versus other people's money that we can use to, to buy down this process. Now, I recognize I didn't give you a number. I would be happy at a later time after the, uh, uh, this group has had more time that if they, and if they want to proceed um, and can say, here's, the, here's what we have in mind. Give me some parameters of what you're thinking you want. I can put some numbers to that. But in the absence of that, I really can't get uh, much more specific. Okay, excellent answer. Uh, yeah, let's move ahead into your third section. We're at about 643, it looks like, so. Great. So, we have grown a membership base, that's over on the right, a, a membership of interested participants, and a, a membership of potential owner members of the co-op over on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, we have created the organization and have uh, identified the business plan for what it takes to uh, implement that plan. Every decent business plan that I have ever done or that I've ever seen has a, a set of financial projections that identify, and here is the minimum equity amount that needs to be uh, raised and, and in the pockets of the cooperative to make this work, all right? Um, and so there is a target there that comes out of the business planning process that says, here's our equity state. And you've also done some other research that says, and here's where the rest of the capital comes from. It's a bank loan or it's a personal loan or whatever. <clears throat> the, you bring together these two sides of the development process here in an equity drive. That's the place in the school gymnasium where the steering committee is up on the stage and they're presenting this idea and saying, and here's the obligation for member owners Here's the business plan that uh, identifies how we think you're going to get a return on investment. Um, and we, we're here to answer questions. And at the end, we're going we're gonna to be open for business. We want to take your money and uh, see if we can meet the equity requirement. So um, uh, that's what we call the equity drive. The equity drive is itself a go, no-go conversation. And if you fall short of that required equity, that's a no-go. 
You can then go back and rewrite the business plan to address the amount of capital you do have. You could go back and try and raise more capital, or you could simply say, you know what, We've, we have done as much as we can. We can't meet that minimum. We're just gonna, uh, it's a no go. All of those are options. <clears throat> if you do reach sufficient equity, then you now have members, okay? When people become members and invest their equity, that's when they become voting members and they have a stake in the decisions that get made. You now actually have a cooperative because you have member owners, you have equity, and you have a plan for how you will take the equity, leverage debt, and implement the plan. So you have a co-op. At this point, there's an important handoff that happens. Remember, we recruited the dream team for the steering committee based on the skill sets and attributes of the individuals that we thought would be necessary to bring this project to a conclusion. Once we have the co-op, this is the time when the steering committee is dismissed with profuse thanks. They have held the idea in trust for its eventual owners. The owners are now present and they say, thank you, all right? And then begins the next process of identifying the next set of leaders for the cooperative. So from the membership, you're gonna hold an election and you're going to create a board of directors. And I suggest that it's appropriate to think about the, the recruitment and, and election of board members in the same way as we thought about the recruitment and selection of the dream team for the steering committee. We're looking for those folks who now have the new skill sets needed to take the business into the next, uh, uh, next iteration. It is not uncommon for members of the steering committee to say, hey, I would like to uh, stand for election to the board. I've been around this idea. Uh, I understand it. I have been part of the learning process. I have valuable expertise to bring. Totally legitimate, totally fine. Um, and it may be possible to say, hey, we have a need for some other skill sets that we didn't need in the steering committee, but what, that we do need now on the board. And so you hold this election and that's the spirit of how you elect board members and bring this into, uh, uh, into fruition. The thing that I would avoid is to say the steering committee slumps into becoming de facto the board. That's not a good practice. Like, you have two different roles, approach them that way, make decisions about who will be in those chairs based on whatever criteria you have. So we select a board. And so now what we have had, we've gone from a steering committee that did some intellectual tire kicking, that incorporated the business, that grew a uh, group of interested members, they did business research, um, got your legal documents in order, brought those together in an equity drive. They've got a bank account, they've got cash in the bank and a plan for development. You have the co-op, you have a board. There you go. That's, that's what we've been about here in this last uh, 45 minutes of conversation. So to go from here, you take the co-op, it's board, they may go out and hire a manager, call them a CEO, you could call them a general manager, whatever your preferences are. In general, the manager is responsible for building whatever, hiring and supervising whatever staff are present. The work of the staff is to create the goodies that everybody invested in all along to say, hey, I want this organization that will receive my products, process them, sell, uh, sell them, ideally at a profit, and give me an economic return. And so the role of the board is to see that the CEO and the staff delivers the goodies and that the goodies come back to the owner members and the circle is complete. And that is where I'm going to stop in this part of the conversation. Going much further kind of puts us in that implementation box. We've kind of edged our toes into it here, but not in a great detail. So this is an overview of the pathway to development that uh, you might end up walking if you should choose to move down this path. 
um, either if with a producer's co-op in Finland or if there's other ideas, these same concepts will apply in other places as well. Stefan, let me be quiet and are there some more questions? Uh, let's see. Um, it looks like um, another little uh, piece of info from, from Corey, kind of about the Finland co-op's history that he, he said for many years, the Finland co-op only had a manager, no employees, and the manager lived at the co-op. <laughs> so, but granted, that was probably a very, very long time ago. <laughs> um, but uh, so we have a question here and it, it sounds like it looks like it's going a little bit more into the implementation area that we just put our toes in, but we'll go yeah. ahead and, and touch base on it. Uh, we've got about 10 more minutes here. Um, so this is a question for, uh, more for operations of the cooperative. Yeah. Um, in a producer co-op, how do you assure quality across the product line? Uh, beef cooperative in Wisconsin hit a major problem when the major procurer of the meat lost customers due to the low quality meat delivery. Um, so basically, how do you how do you, how would you you suggest in a cooperative endeavor that you maintain quality with multiple players and multiple producers? Huge challenge, and it is a bugaboo for every specialty crop or you know specialty product. Uh, cooperative that I'm aware of because uh, at the producer level we uh, we have a tension between um, what's good enough and how much um, stuff do I have that's good enough and what are some things that are on the borderline that if nobody you know looks too hard you know or certain customers might say is just fine and other customers would say uh, no thank you um, the I think the key ends up being, well, okay, let me identify a couple of other tensions. Another tension, so the, the producer faces a tension. They only get paid for stuff that they produce that meets specifications, all right? And everybody that I've ever met usually would like to have more income than less income, and so there's a tension to try and slide by. Um, I'll tell you about a pork processing cooperative that I worked with once where in their second week in uh, delivering and receiving live hogs from their owner members, uh, one member slipped in a couple of boars in the, uh, uh, in the delivery. Um, I'll tell you the meat quality from uh, breeding animals is not usually considered up to snuff for eating animals and that was a problem. And the, the producer, you know, so there was a mismatch there. Um, it becomes even more complicated when you're dealing with multiple products. What constitutes quality in a tomato is likely to be different than for collards, is likely to be different than sweet corn. So there is almost certainly a need to define standards. The co-op needs to define standards, usually in, in uh, conjunction with whatever a market definition is. So your customers actually um, will set a definition of what quality they expect because they're paying a bit, uh, they're paying the tab and they're going to say meets these standards we'll pay this below that standard we will pay less or nothing so it's it's got to be driven by the markets that you compete in it needs to be upheld by some form of central management usually that's a manager could be a, com uh, a committee of growers um but somebody needs to be able to speak to other members eyeball to eyeball and say, your stuff didn't meet grade this week. You know, ain't gonna pay you, can't pay you. You know, uh, we'll try and salvage it by selling it to, you know, an off, off uh, uh, some other um, customer. But if they can't do that, your return is zero. And in fact, we're gonna charge you for the cost of sorting and regrading the product that you brought in. So it's a very real conversation. It depends on what products you have. This is a place where there needs to be strong internal agreement on what constitutes quality um, that is acceptable to the cooperative and that's acceptable to the cooperative's customers. And the idea that, for example, the, a, a beef cooperative was buying um, animals that didn't meet spec. Um, yeah, uh, buyers have lots of opportunities of where to sell, uh, where to buy things. 
Um, and they usually have more options than the producers do. And so it it's, needs to be in, uh, addressed with intention, uh, intentionality and with integrity. Okay, excellent thoughts. Um, we have uh, we have one other question kind of hanging out here that we should uh, yeah about six fifty five. Uh, can you talk about a reasonable timeline um, to expect from the process from the hey a bunch of people sitting around we should do all the way up to kind of the cooperative organization? How what have you seen? How long does that kind of typically take as people work through it? Well, I would say one to two years. It is entirely possible that a, uh, that a group of farmers, um, particularly if we're talking, you know, 10, 20, uh, 5, 10, 20, could get their heads around a common idea and have something dipping their toe in some type of, a, of marketing next uh, spring, summer. That doesn't surprise me. However, my experience in 30 years of working with farmer-owned cooperatives is that farmers only work on their co-ops about five months of the year. Now it happens to be between um, last frost or freeze and uh, the time that you can get a, a, a disc in the ground. So, you know, that's a, a five month window. So how much agreement can be made in a five month window is kind of the question I'd put back at you. Um, it's possible that you could have a business in place, maybe a limited business and maybe on a pilot basis. Um, to have a fully built out uh, enterprise next summer, possible, but it would require a whole lot of thinking, talking, and agreement. And um, I wouldn't promise that. Okay. Any other? Also, that, I'm sorry, one more thing. That also depends on hitting some of the deadlines. If you have, if, if cash is your, uh, you, all the members are prepared to write checks and you don't have to go writing grants to get capital for certain processes. Um, that's kind of a, one of those built-in assumptions too. Excellent point. Yes, because uh, there are lots of deadlines that once you pass them, oftentimes you have to wait a full full year cycle, annual cycle to, to yeah, apply for those. Exactly. Grants. Yeah. Okay, uh, <clears throat> looks like we have just a couple minutes left. Any other final thoughts out there, questions or thoughts? Don't see anything at this point. Um, and again, so if you ever want to uh, find this, uh, replay this video or re-listen to it, we will have this uh, probably in about a week or so. It will be up on the Finland Food Chain website. Um, you just go to the Learn tab at the top and uh, that will then show you that. Oh, looks like we, let's see here, we have one more. Oh, excellent info, thank you. I guess that's not a question, it's, it's a thumbs up to you there, Kevin. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, but yeah, otherwise, and uh, Kevin, uh, did your website is again for the CDS? It's www.cdsus.coop. Okay. And uh, yeah, I believe that your this presentation is also up on it there is. as a PDF. Yes. yes. So that's where you can find all the information you need. And uh, if there's no other questions. I think we'll go ahead and check out here. Okay, great food for thought. People are saying that's perfect. <laughs> Thank Super. you so much. Thank you so much, Kevin. We appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you very much.